Well, hello everyone. Woo, hopefully that got your attention. I see a little bit of kind of milling around and that's a good thing. And hopefully uh, we've got people getting settled and getting ready online as well to join us. But I just want to thank each and every one of you for your time and, and being with us, whether you are in person or online. And it is a joy to come together. Thankfully we've got better weather, better air quality, and we're gonna have a good time worshiping the Lord this morning. But if you are a guest or getting to know Calvary a little bit better, one of the things we want to do is we want to connect with you. And we've got a digital connect card. So if you're sitting here or you're at home, you can go to our website, pull out your smartphone, and just go to cbcmodesto.org slash connect. And we've got a card there that allows us just to get to know you a little bit better and get some information from you. And our promise is not to be invasive uh, or ask you too many questions. We just want to connect with you and begin to build that relationship. There's a a lot that we need from one another in our time together. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for joining us in worship. A couple of things that we don't have on the screen, but I, I do want to mention. Obviously, we're close to October. We're looking at different activities and things we have typically done and having to rethink a lot of things. And one of those things we're rethinking and looking at is, is the time of Halloween. Typically, we have a fall festival, and so we're trying to figure out what we're going to do with that. So if you are here this morning or watching online, if you can get in contact with my wife, Heather, and just see her, um, she's just kind of beginning to brainstorm and has had some conversations with others. Is there a way we can do that? Uh, we understand there is anxiety in people and touching things and sharing things, so we want to make sure that we are mindful of that, but we still want to share the love of Jesus. And so if you're interested in that, you can see Heather or contact her um, either through the church office. We'll, we'll get you in touch with her as well. But I want to thank you for thinking about that, and please be praying for us on how we handle that. One of the things that's also important is we want to honor people. And a lot of times people do things, and there's a lot of times people do things, and they don't want to be thanked for it. But I've got someone I want to honor this morning, so I'm going to walk by the camera here. So I, I know this is not expected and didn't tell anyone anything about this, but I'm going to ask Miss Cynthia if she will come up here. I know she's sitting over there and not, not even hearing, so yeah, you, you can at least get close to the camera. So y'all may not be aware, but Friday, September 18th, was the third anniversary of Cynthia working in the office. And so it's been three, three years. And so... I wanted to give you a beautiful plant because one, I think that symbolizes the fact that uh, your ministry is growing and we want to continue to see it grow. And just a little something to say thank you on behalf of myself and Calvary as well. So thank you very much for all that you do. And, and one of the things I think, yes, please just give me a hand. You, you may not realize, but uh, obviously in this COVID time, our office is doesn't have regular hours, but Cynthia is consistent at checking on things, stopping by, grabbing the mail, whatever it may be. But we actually have the phones forwarded right now. And so she's been very diligent in wanting, wanting people to stay connected and answering the phone on Saturday, Sunday. And there are times I've said to her, hey, it's okay for you to take a break. It's okay. We have a machine. But she just loves you all and consistent with the care for you. And so, uh, again, we just want to say thank you, Cynthia, for your time and, and what a blessing she has been um, to me and I know to Calvary as well. So we, we want to continue to say thank you. We have people faithfully doing a lot of things. And so we're glad that you're here joining us. And one of the things that is important as we say thank you, we definitely want to thank the Lord because God has given us a lot of things. He's given us relationships. He's given us people. He's also given us financial blessings. And so we want to take time to honor him and thank him for that. We do have our box that we use, which is right back here next to our sound booth for our tithes and offerings. So if you happen to bring that with you, or if you're going to give online, you can go to our website, cbcmodesto.org slash give, and you can see the different ways you can do that. But we want to remember all that God has given us and say thank you to him and give it back to him. So later on in our service, we will pray over that. And I want to say thank you for your faithfulness your faithfulness over this time. We, God is still giving. We still want to give back to him. So as I mentioned, we're going to pray later on in the service. We're going to pray as we get started. But if you have any prayer requests, we want to lift those up to the Lord. 
So if you have anything, you can share those. We've got a prayer form on our website, slash prayer, and you can share that with us. Let us know if you want that kept private, which will stay in the office, or if you want it on our prayer list. There's a lot of things we continue to pray for, a lot of needs that we have. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, because prayer has a powerful place in our lives. So I want to thank you all for joining us in this time of worship. If you want to, and stand and sing with us. But we're going to go before the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to be here. We're going to ask the Lord to lead us and guide us in our time of worship. So if you want to, let's stand and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Our Father God in heaven. Lord, we thank you that we can come here today to praise your name, to worship you. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us and that we can look at the skies and that they declare your glory and we can see your handiwork all around us but lord even more that we thank you that you've revealed yourself through christ jesus and lord we thank you uh, that we can just be here today to praise you and god we're going to sing some songs about hope and, and lord i just pray that we can put all our hope in you or there's a lot of things that we're asking for for rain or vaccine or the election results or all these things that we feel like are good and we know that we need them or we feel like we need them but god i just pray that right now we we just know and recognize that we need you more than any of those things lord and i pray that out of our hearts lord we can just believe that and praise you because you are our hope holy spirit guide us in this time of worship in jesus name amen Come on, you weary. Come on, you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come on, you sinners. Come find his mercy. Come to the table. He will satisfy. Yeah. 
We love that song and I hope you enjoy it as well. Um, I hope everyone had a chance to get some music. If you don't, I know Ginger still got some. If you need one, just kind of make that known. But it's good to see you singing and please join us as we continue to sing. Jesus, for those who have put their faith and trust in you, you have become a cornerstone. And just a reminder to us of how good you are and how much, Lord, you bless us with yourself. Forgiveness is not something we deserve. Grace is not something we deserve. The cross is what we deserve. But Jesus, you took it for us. And so as we take the time to think about our finances and what you have given to us, may we give it back. To remember it all comes from you. But thank you, Father. Bless all these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
got your Bible or your Bible app, we are going to be back in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. So hopefully you can join me in reading God's Word in just a moment. Philippians chapter 4 is where we are going to be. So I'm just going to ask if you can kind of keep an eye on that ringing a little bit. If you have to pull it back, that's distracting. Her. All right, are we ready? Are we ready? All right, just checking to see if people are responsive or not. That's good. That's good. All right. I'm curious, have you ever wanted the ability? To read people's minds. Oh, yeah. You never thought to yourself, man, if I had that power, that ability, wouldn't that be interesting? Right. Be interesting. Now, whether or not you've thought about it, at least people in Hollywood have thought about it. There are definitely movies about being able to hear the thoughts of other people. Right. But as I think about it, there's a part of me that goes, there's, there's some excitement to that. If I could read people's minds, hmm. But there's other parts where I'm like, mm, that could be scary. 
that could be really scary. I mean, the exciting part is you think, I'd always know. You know, think about those moments you cook a new meal and you're not sure if everybody likes it, you would know. Okay? Because if you can read their mind, they'd be like, oh, that's good. And in their head, they're thinking, oh, that was the worst thing I've ever tasted. Okay? You would know where they're at. And I think in relationships, this would probably solve some things for some of the ladies. Because I've seen at times where a lady will ask a guy, what are you thinking? And a guy says nothing. And she doesn't believe him. But I think she would find out it's true. We can actually think nothing. Okay? That, that's a gift. Okay? There are times as guys, we can think nothing. But see, on, on the, the scary, the terrifying side is you would know everything. When people were being maybe nice to your face and then thinking things about you, you would know it. Nothing would be hidden as far as that goes. And so I think it's probably safer that we don't have that ability. It's probably a good thing God did not give that to us. Because then we have to communicate with one another. But the fact is the mind is powerful. The mind directly impacts how we think, and how we feel. And so because of that, in chapter 4, this is where Paul is now headed. Because what Paul is saying in chapter 4 of Philippians is saying, I want you to have a secure mind. I want your mind to be secure as an individual because how your mind is as an individual is going to translate into the community. And as a community, we need a community mindset that is focused on Jesus. And so with that in mind, we're going to see what Paul is talking about with our minds. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, let's read from Philippians 4. If you want to stand and join me for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in Philippians 4, and we're going to start with verse 1. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stay true to the Lord. I love you and long to see you, dear friends. For you are my joy and the crown I receive from my work. Now I appeal to... Euodia and Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading of His Word. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You for You for your love, your willingness to send Jesus, Jesus, your willingness to go to the cross. Holy Spirit, your closeness, your power that you give us. I thank you for all of it. And I just ask, Holy Spirit, in this time that you would speak to our hearts. As your word tells us, you are the one who convicts us of sin, leads us into all truth. We need you right now. These words have no power without you. And I pray that you would empower them, move in our hearts and minds to hear you this morning. I thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you look across everything that Paul has written, which honestly he was the, the one who wrote most of the New Testament, but in each of his writings to the different churches, such as the Corinthians, or he's writing to the Philippians, in this case, his goal is to help the community. His goal is to help them. And one of the things he cares about in this community in particular, in Philippi, is their unity. As a community, their common unity is the gospel. It's the gospel and reminding us as well that humanity has a problem. Humanity has a problem, and this problem is sin. But see, having this problem, God loves us so much he didn't leave us. So that sin is our problem, but Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one who deals with our sin problem. And so Paul is reminding the Philippians and reminding us to be united around the gospel. And he started in chapter 1, he said in verse 27, Above all else, you must live in a way that brings honor to the good news about Christ. 
So again, the focus is on the gospel, the good news of Jesus, but how we live impacts how people respond to that. But also how we live is impacted by our thinking. The way you and I think directly affects what we do. And so there is daily a battle for our minds. It's a battle for our mind and what we think and how we process things. And in Philippians chapter 2, Paul told us how to think. In verse 5, he says, and think the same way that Christ Jesus thought. And then he follows that up with verses and talking about Jesus' humility and Jesus' perspective about the kingdom of God and bringing God close to the world and showing the world Jesus and that he didn't hold his rights as God, but instead set them aside and came down to earth from heaven. He said, have the same attitude that Jesus had. And so as Paul has already been having these statements and perspective about our thinking, he really narrows down in chapter 4. And he's going to begin to focus on our thinking. But he begins in verse 1. Stand firm. Stay true to the Lord. The gospel again. Stand firm on this. You can rest on this. But one of the things that is dangerous is our thinking can get distracted. And so in addressing these two ladies, he's saying, settle this disagreement. This disagreement is distracting. It's distracting you. It's distracting the church. And your thoughts need to be focused on the gospel. That's where our mind needs to be. But now, Paul really moves into verses 4 through 7. He's going to talk about our mind and our thinking. Because his desire is, he wants our mind to be secure. We are often concerned about our valuables and different things. And you see online, your identity, your internet access, all these things. Be secure. But do we spend as much time thinking about our mind? Is our mind secure? Because that's where the enemy wants to come at you. That's where the enemy wants to attack you. And so to have a secure mind individually is going to translate into a community mindset that's focused on Jesus. But what's interesting, as we look at verse 4 and following, Paul actually starts with the result. He tells you first in verse 4, Always be full of the joy in the Lord. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. See, there is no joy within you when your mind is focused on struggles. When your mind is focused on pain, worry, anxiety, all the things going on, there is no opportunity for joy. But notice when he tells us to rejoice. Always. And see, I, I have no doubt we can kind of have this conversation with ourselves or other people. Well, even when, and you complete the sentence, even when my marriage is struggling, even when I lose my job, even when I lose a loved one, even when we're in a pandemic. See, we ask that question, even when? And the fact is, there's no situation beyond the Lord's help. There's no situation. And see, that's also part of why Paul was saying to these ladies, solve your disagreement. Because what's happening is joy is getting smothered by division. And I think, honestly, that's a little bit of what we're seeing today as well. Joy gets smothered when there's distraction, division, and things going on. And so that's why Paul was addressing these ladies. Because unity becomes the fertile soil which allows joy to grow. We want joy. We want to experience that. But see, I think even as I talk about joy, our thoughts often go to the feelings that we think. And joy doesn't begin in the heart, it begins in the mind. It begins in the mind because there are times when things don't feel right. But correct thinking, a secure mind, reminds us that everything is all right because Jesus is in control. See, and that doesn't mean I walk around Pollyanna, oh, everything's great. That doesn't mean we ignore the reality of the situation, but we realize who's in control of the situations. And that's what allows joy to come forward. And that's how Paul can say that to us, to rejoice. And when our mind is secure, this is part of what we get to experience. But Paul doesn't stop there in verse 4. He goes on into verse 5, and he gives us something to do and something to keep in mind. He gets very specific. In verse 5, he says, Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. 
See, what do people see in how you live? You understand, I'm not asking that question to say you put on a show. That you fake things. But it should remind us and make us question ourselves. Where am I at in my walk with Jesus if I'm not experiencing some of these things? Because Paul's reminding us, you have something you can do. You can live in a considerate way. And that word considerate basically means like a gentle spirit. You show mercy. You put others before yourself. Which, huh? And that's what Jesus did. And so what happens is instead of being your mind consumed with you, you begin to think about others. And to realize you're not the only one going through things. But the God who loves you loves the whole world. And see, you can live in a way that shows the world, hey, God is in control. I don't understand all the situations, but God is in control of everything going on. But in that last verse, there's an interesting translation at the end of verse 5. It says, the Lord is coming soon. That word translated coming soon is defined as close in time or place or relationship. So coming soon would be a correct translation in regards to close in time. See, there's another encouragement here because it says a close in place or relationship. Some of your versions will say the Lord is near. He's near. And so Paul's trying to remind you, keep in mind, keep thinking about the fact that you're not alone. The Lord is near. Yes, he's coming soon, so keep that in mind as well. But don't forget, he's already here with you. Jesus said to his disciples, I've got to go because when I leave, guess what? You've got someone who's coming and is going to be with you. And we see that unfold in Acts chapter 2. At Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is, re is received. So realize, right now, we've got one who is close, an advocate, a helper. And see, we need this because we're in a time of unrest. We're in a time of division. We're in a time of we just don't know. We don't know what's coming next. We don't know when something's going to end. 2020 is just kind of like a bad joke. Paul is helping us to remember, do, be gentle, be considerate to others, but don't forget the Lord is near. You're not alone. You see, one of the things in all this is I think we feel like we've got to, to do, we've got to work, we've got to earn, I'm going to make this happen. We kind of clench our fists, we're going to white knuckle it, all right, I'm going to be joyful. You're not getting joy that way. You see, we don't need a human response. We need a spirit-empowered response. We need some things we can't do. And that's why verses 6 and 7 are so profound. Because Paul's saying, your mind and the security of it is based upon prayer and finding peace in Jesus. Because in verse 6, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I don't know about you all. When someone tells me not to do something, it almost like backfires because like, I want to do that. Or when someone says, calm down. They're like, no, I'm not going to be calm. Don't tell me to calm down. You know, all right? So when Paul says, don't worry, all right. Can't you hear the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy? You got that in the background, little Hakuna Matata going on? Okay, thank you, Paul. Don't worry. All right, solved it for me. That's it. See, I don't think Paul's being like that. I don't think Paul's being flip, flippant in what he's saying. Paul's got an excuse to worry. Uh, he's in prison. Paul's in prison right now. He's facing his own death. You would think that might cause somebody to worry. What's coming next? Yet he writes, don't worry about anything. See, this idea of worry is the idea of being pulled in different directions. Your mind is going in different directions. You're all over the place because you're unsure, you're unsettled. And the old English word where we actually get our word worry from is defined as to strangle. So as you're being pulled in all these different directions, what's getting strangled is the joy and the peace. You got none of it. You got none of it. 
And so we've got wrong thinking going on because our focus is on all the things we're worried about. Then we move to wrong feeling because then the anxiety and all that grows because that's all we're focused on. And that's going to be our greatest thief of joy. That's when we worry, when we're anxious. But Paul gives an alternative. He's not going to say, hey, don't worry. What he says is pray. Pray. And what's interesting is I read out of the New Living Translation. It says pray about everything. But in other translations, like the New American Standard NIV, it actually gives you three different words. It starts with prayer. And what's meant here by prayer is this is reverent petition. This is adoration. This is worship. Remember who you're talking to. See, the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, our Father who art in heaven, this is the God of the universe we're talking to. This isn't just Joe Schmo, somebody on the street. This is the God of the universe who can handle anything and has handled anything, created everything. So remember who we're talking to, worship. Then it says, your supplication or your petition, this is an urgent request, a need you have. Bring it to the Lord. As Jesus said in the model prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Ask for what your needs are. Bring it before the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. But at the end, he also says, with thanksgiving. An attitude of gratitude. But there's two parts to that. It's what God has already done, but you're also already thanking him for the answer. Because God does answer. But see, too often the problem is we don't ask. We don't ask. And so Paul is saying, instead of worry, pray. Pray. Well, one of the things we've got to remember, and I, I have no doubt we can each share a story of a prayer we prayed that didn't get answered. But you know what? That may be the best thing that could have ever happened to us. Because we don't pray because God will answer. We pray because God can answer. We've got to keep that in mind. There are times he says no. There are times he says wait. But see, part of coming before God is to remember who we're talking to. Because often what happens is prayer doesn't always change things. Prayer changes us. And Paul goes on. What is the result of prayer? Peace. Peace. And this is what he was talking about in verse 7. You will experience God's peace. This is divine peace we're talking about. You can't manufacture this. You can't make this happen. Because it says in that verse, which exceeds anything we can understand. Some translations say it transcends. We can't understand this peace. But see, peace is not about the circumstance. Because that's one of the biggest things we also have to remember. Is the circumstances don't always change. Three times Paul prayed when he received this thorn in the flesh. And we don't know what the thorn in the flesh was. Some people say it was a physical issue. We don't know. Three times he prayed. And God's response was, nope, I'm not taking it from you. But what he did say is, my grace is sufficient for you. What you're going to get is me. I'm going to walk through this with you. So your circumstance may not change, but you got me. I'm in control of the circumstances. And so as this peace comes, this peace overcomes knowledge. Because one of the things that gets in our way is our own thinking. Peace overcomes knowledge. Because when you look at the situation logically, a lot of times it doesn't make sense. And see, that's part of the way that you can live in a way that makes the gospel look good and is honored. Because people look at your life and go, life is chaos. How do you have joy and peace? And then we get to say, Jesus, that's how. And we get to explain them what it, to them what it looks like. You see, oftentimes, also our knowledge can't explain the situation. And sometimes when you try to explain the situation, it doesn't help. That's one of the things I think when people are grieving and going through hard times, sometimes it's best to, to close your mouth and sit next to them. Don't, don't say anything. Because sometimes we try to say things. You know, let go and let God. And we throw out a lot of times these kind of cheesy Christianisms. And sometimes all people need is just presence. 
And see what Paul is saying here, the presence you get is Jesus. And he comes alongside of you with a peace that does not make sense. You can't explain. But notice at the end of verse 7 what it says about this peace, how this peace guards. Because see, remember, Paul's in prison right now. He's most likely chained to a Roman soldier. So day and night, he's got this Roman soldier next to him. And he understands this guy's guarding me all the time. And this idea is, is a, it's a military term. And what Paul is saying, there's a strength here. This peace, it guards your heart and your mind. Because instead of wondering and thinking of all what could be and well, what if and what, what are all these things? Focus on who God is. God, you are everything. You can do all things. And see, peace is on duty to defend against anxiety. Peace is on duty to defend against worry, to guard our hearts and minds. And this is the peace that Paul is talking about. And so what Paul is trying to say to you is a prayerful person is a peaceful person. A prayerful person is a peaceful person. And I think one of the greatest illustrations I think you see of this in Scripture is Daniel. I mean, think about Daniel. He is in exile from Judah. He's been taken to a foreign land. And God watches over him. And thankfully, God does bless him. But one of the things he does every day is he prays. Three times a day, he goes in, opens the door, sits down and prays. And as he's praying, he's talking to God. But then come along these guys who are jealous of them. They don't like how he's got this relationship with the king and he's got power and stuff. And so they basically trick the king into making a law. If they don't pray, if they pray to anybody else but you, they get thrown in the lion's den. But notice, once Daniel hears this, what does he do? He freaks out. Oh! No, he doesn't freak out. He goes home and he prays. Same habit. He's not thinking about the law that was just made. He's saying, God, I know who you are. What am I going to do? What I've been doing? I'm going to go home and pray. And they catch him. Tell the king. King realizes what's going on, but he can't go back on his word. And he ends up in the lion's den. Ends up in the lion's den. And I just have this picture. Just like a little kitty, there's Daniel sitting there the next morning, just petting the lion. And everybody's like, what? But man, it says, if you read the scripture, that they got thrown in, those guys who wanted to get Daniel, and before they hit the ground, those lions were up in the air. Tore them up. And you think God won't fight for you? You think God won't hold you up when you do what he says? Oh, he will. But I love Daniel's example is because he found the peace that focused his mind and he knew where to go. And his mind stayed secure because he knew the only one who could provide true peace is God. Now, I realize there are things going on today. No doubt, and I think we look at our time and go, man, we got, do we have a reason to worry? You see, one of the things we realize is, or need to think about is, do we take scripture for what it says? Because sometimes I think we read the Bible and then we add exceptions. Do not worry about anything, unless it's a pandemic. No, it doesn't say that. It says, do not worry about anything. And while I think there might be reasons where we could understand what's going on. And we would feel anything but peaceful. I want us to think about a guy by the name of Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford. Now, I don't know if you've heard that name before. But this is a guy who lived in the late 19th century. He was a successful attorney, real estate investor. But in the Chicago fire of 1871, he lost all of it. Lost all his fortune. Around the same time, he had a son who died of scarlet fever. And so he's trying to figure out what to do. He's his wife, and he's still got four daughters. He decides, you know what, Let, let's take a vacation. Let's, let's just get away from things for a while. But he's still got some business to take care of. And so what he does is he puts his wife and four daughters on a ship and says, hey, you head over to England. i got to finish some business, and I'm going to join you. But then he gets word later from his wife in England 
that the ship had a collision and sunk. And his four daughters died. And I've no doubt this guy's like, can there be more? Can there be more? God, why am I going through all this? He gets on a ship and he's heading to England to be with his wife. The captain knew about this, knew everything that was going on. And he told him about the spot when they reached. And he said, this is probably the place where that ship went down. And he's sitting there and he's thinking about everything going on. And all of a sudden the words come across his mind. When peace like a river attendeth my way. And if you know that line, that comes from a song, it is well with my soul. Horatio wrote that song at that moment after going through all of that. You want to talk about a peace that transcends all understanding? How do you find peace in a moment like that? See, it doesn't come from us, it comes from God. You see, are we going to him? Are we praying? So you have to ask yourself, what's on your mind today? Are the things on your mind going to bring peace? Because Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. See, when we think like Jesus, when we think about Jesus, this leads to peace. This leads to a community mindset that keeps us united and guards us. But the question I have is, are you at peace today? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are good and faithful. Lord, there's so much going on right now that weighs on us. Father, we think about our health. We may be thinking about money. We're thinking about our family. Lord, all the things going on in our world, it makes sense. Why we get anxious, why we get worried. But Father, you're calling us to think about you. So Father, I just ask that you help us to be prayerful people. That you would help us to turn our thoughts to you. And Lord, maybe that means we need to turn off the TV a little more. Maybe that means we need to get off social media, stop reading the paper. Maybe there's places where we need to stop filling our minds with all the things that are creating more worry and anxiety. You just open your word. Because, Father, we need this peace. We need this peace that doesn't make sense. This peace that Isaiah described as a perfect peace. Jesus, I want that. I pray we all want that. And, Lord, if there's anyone this morning either here with us, watching, listening, Jesus, maybe they've never said yes to you. Maybe it's they're trying to live this life hoping they can manufacture peace if they've got enough money in the bank, if they've got a good job, a place to live, all the things. And yet any of those things can be gone in a moment. I pray that today we the day to say, Jesus, I need you. I need you. That they would put their faith and their trust in you. And Jesus, please help us to stop trusting in other things other people. You are the only one who is consistently faithful. You never change. And so secure our minds. The battle is on. But as we walk in with people of peace and joy, you will do great things in us and through us. Lead us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what's going on in your heart and your mind. I know a lot of people are anxious and worried today. Jesus is the one who changes that. He's the one who changes that. So I pray that you would spend a little more time with him. Open his word. 
spend time talking to him. But if you've made any decision where you've said, you know what, I, I need to, if it's just a practical thing, you know what, I'm going to maybe get off social media for a little bit. If you made that type of decision, you want to share that with us so we can encourage you, please do so. We've got a form online on our website, forward slash decision. And we want to help you. We want to encourage you in that. Because part of it is we need each other. That's the community part. To encourage one another. There's moments when we're down and we need someone to say, hey, I understand. Jesus understands. You're not alone. We need those reminders. So if you've made any type of decision, if you said, I want to follow Jesus today, we absolutely want to encourage you in that. Let us know. If you have any prayer requests, please share this with us again. Our form is online. We need each other. The community is what helps us keep going. But part of the joy comes from remembering who God is, how much God loves us. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you need. He knows where you are. But we need to remember how much He loves us. So we're going to close by singing the song we started with, God So Loved. You've got the words in front of you, but just that reminder. God so loved us. And remember, that love doesn't change. So let's stand and let's sing. Let's sing with some joy that God so loved the world. And for our tech team, we're just going to cut out the, uh, the bridge and the ending. So we'll do the rest of the song. God